Hello and welcome back. We are on learning module nine. This one's titled Implicit Cognition. As a side note, we've run out of the textbook for this semester. There are no more chapters left. And for the rest of the semester, all of the readings will be assigned uh, right here and they'll be available on Blackboard. So there are no textbook readings today. I've assigned this paper here. Preferences need no inferences. The cognitive basis of unconscious mere exposure effects. This would be a nice supplement to what we're going to talk about in the lecture. Also, I want to point out that there's another paper, Remembering by the Seat of Your Pants. Very interesting. It's a short five page paper. When we get to the second midterm, which is coming up, uh, you'll be having some questions about this paper. And you can go and find this paper on the Blackboard website. If you want to get a head start on reading this paper, you can do the generalization assignment here. And this asks you to read the paper and answer a few questions. So if you did this assignment, you'd be helping yourself study for the midterm. All right, let's jump into the slides. Here we are, implicit influences and the mere exposure effect. Almost sounds like the name of uh, some pop band or something. I just went over these reminders uh, just to reiterate any readings for this module will be a PDF available on Blackboard. And uh, this is the last learning module before our second midterm. We've got three things to cover in uh, this mini lecture. I'm going to break it into two parts. This part will cover implicit versus explicit cognition and the mere exposure effect. And then the second part we'll talk about some ways that people have tested explanations of this phenomena called the mere exposure effect. And just as a heads up, there's lots of examples of implicit influences in cognition. And I've just chosen this one here, the mere exposure effect, to dive into some of those details. So this distinction, implicit versus explicit cognition. I'm going to say that cognitive psychology as a discipline often distinguishes between implicit and explicit processes. And what does this distinction actually refer to? Here are some features that are commonly used to distinguish these two different kinds of processes. So for implicit, we have processes that are usually or thought of as unaware. They might be automatic. They might happen without you thinking about them. These things could happen pretty quickly and without a whole lot of effort on your part. So that's a kind of list of definitions or of features for an implicit process. By contrast, we have explicit processes. These are typically thought of as requiring awareness. They're things you know about. They're controlled and they could be slow and effortful or strategic and rule based. I'm going to go through a few examples just to make these uh, ideas a little bit more concrete. And before we do that, let's consider some of the ways in which this distinction is used in cognition. First of all, this distinction is used to help describe and classify particular cognitive abilities. Additionally, Cognitive psychologists often make claims about implicit versus explicit processing. For example, someone might claim that this kind of cognitive ability is driven by an implicit memory system. Or someone else might claim, actually, no, this particular ability is driven by a explicit memory system. One of the things we see quite often in research is that Individual researchers attempt to gather evidence to determine whether a particular cognitive phenomena or ability reflects implicit or explicit processing. When we take a look at the mere exposure effect, we'll see an example of this. So let's ask the, the question implicit or explicit question mark. What I'm going to have you do is consider whether the situation described right here requires implicit or explicit processes. So for example, somebody listens to a song 
and says they like it. What's going on here? Um, I mean, first of all, let's consider some of the cognitive abilities associated with this situation. So people have to hear things. They have uh, some auditory sensations going on. They're able to understand all sorts of different kinds of auditory information and they're evaluating it. They're making a judgment. They're using their language processes to say out loud that they like it. So they've listened to something, they've formed a, an opinion about it. And in this case, they're saying they actually like this song quite a bit. So could this reflect an implicit kind of cognitive process or an explicit one? Uh, I'm going to consider both sides, and at the end of the day, I think I will recognize that it could be a little bit of both. So let's consider the ways it could be implicit. First of all, maybe the person just automatically had a gut feeling about the song. They didn't have to think about whether they liked the song or not. They just listened to it, and they liked it right away. And maybe they can't even explain why they like it. If th this seems plausible to you, or you've had an experience like this, uh, you might be nod along, nodding along and saying, yeah, I think actually I can probably th um, come up with a bunch of examples in my own life where I, I just seem to like things without really thinking too much about it. It's almost like my preference is just happening, and uh, I didn't do a lot of uh, rationalizing to form that preference. On the other hand, we could consider this to be uh, involving explicit processes. So for example, maybe the person is um, an expert in listening to music and they decided to deliberately analyze the song as they were listening to it. They might be able to provide a whole bunch of reasons why they like the song. Maybe the song follows certain kinds of rules, or maybe it violates certain kinds of rules in, in music in general. Perhaps this person's reason for saying they like the song has to do with this list of uh, effortfully generated reasons. Now, I think you could form a preference for something like a song in both of these ways. So I'm going to say that uh, having a preference about something could involve potentially implicit processes, and it could also involve potentially explicit processes. Let's do one more. How about something like a person makes the next move in a chess match? So the game of chess is sometimes thought of as, you know, requiring a lot of strategy, and you have to think really hard about everything that you do, and you have to know all their rules. So we might think about this situation as requiring a lot of explicit processing, but we could also consider uh, how it could be involving some implicit processes. For example, perhaps the person playing chess is an expert. They might have lots and lots of practice playing chess, so much practice that many of the moves they make, they do almost automatically without even thinking about it. Their prior experience allows them to play chess in an almost reflexive manner. And in this sense, their next move could be made on an implicit basis. At the same time, their next move could be highly deliberated. They might be thinking about the consequences of this move and other future moves that might happen. And of course, it's possible that the person will make their move based on this explicit reasoning. So we just went over two scenarios uh, and considered whether they could potentially involve implicit or explicit processing. And in both scenarios, we, or at least I'm coming back to the point that we, we could acknowledge that there's probably a little bit of both, or at least could be a little bit of both going on. Um, in general, I will say, to the extent that a cognitive ability or behavior is being driven by implicit processes, we're interested in understanding you know, how these things work. How could you do something without really being aware of it? 
How could a skill become automatic with practice? How do you get to the point so that you could do something really quickly and effortlessly? Uh, how does learning and memory support those kinds of things? At the same time, we have the ability to use our language and um, understand rules and evaluate things in a slow, effortful, and deliberate manner. And how we do those things is another kind of question. Okay, so I'll make the point that, in general, we should acknowledge that implicit and explicit processes uh, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. A complex cognitive behavior could be a mixture of both implicit and explicit processes. We're about to jump into uh, a thin strip of research into implicit influences. We're going to focus on the mere exposure effect as an example. There's lots of examples of implicit influences in cognition, and we don't have time to go into them all in this survey course, but I've listed some of them here. You could just click these links and go uh, check these things out. All right, so let's get into the mere exposure effect. So the mere exposure effect was reported in June of 1968 by a psychologist named Robert Zients. At least I think that's how you say his last name. In a paper called Attitudinal Effects of Mere Exposure. Here's the short takeaway of what is the mere exposure effect. It's the idea or finding that repeated exposure to a stimulus enhances positive attitude toward the stimulus. Basically, the more you see something, the more you will like it. Uh, another way of talking about it is familiarity breeds liking. The more you experience something, and just by virtue of experiencing it, the more familiar it becomes, and you will have a bias towards positively evaluating that stimulus. That, that's the concept here. So is it true? Can you think of some examples from your own life where you like things just because they happened a lot to you? Or maybe you can think of some counterexamples. Uh, we're going to evaluate some of the evidence for this effect. And if it's a general effect, what we should see is many situations where if you show somebody something repeatedly, then they'll like that thing more and more. So does this happen? And what are the uh, what, what does the evidence look like? Let's check it out. Okay, the evidence for the mere exposure effect. I'm going to summarize some of the things that were published in this paper. This was a paper where Robert Science reviews in 1968 a number of reasons that uh, come together to provide, uh, let's call it like a, a a whole bunch of lines of evidence for the mere exposure effect. So here's one. And the first set of evidence I'm going to talk about is non-experimental evidence. So this one is the finding that preference for words depends on word frequencies. And what happened here was participants were shown antonym pairs. For example, able versus unable, you'd see both of those words. Or maybe you'd see victory versus defeat. Or maybe you'd see love versus hate, or so on. You'd always see two words. And participants were just asked to choose the more favorable word. The finding was that people were influenced by word frequency. So what we're looking at in this table here is that if you look down this row here, we can see the the word that people tended to prefer versus the word that was non-preferred. And if you look down here, actually, I mean, these are all kind of like positive sounding words. And these are more negative sounding. 
And what science is pointing out is that the preferred words also occur more frequently in the language. So, for example, the word able has a higher frequency, 930, than the word unable, uh, which has a lower frequency. And just to be clear, word frequency means uh, how often you exp these individual words would t tend to occur in the natural language. I'm just going to take a quick pause here and show us an example of word frequency today using something called Google Trends. Let me go over there and I'll be right back. Okay, here I am. I'm at the Google Trends website. And what you could do here is enter in search terms. And basically you could see a graph about how many times people search this term. We we're just talking about the words able and unable. So if I put in the word able here, what we're seeing is a graph of interest over time. This is a measure roughly of how many times people search this word over time over the last year. And we could compare this with the word unable. How, how about that? Let's do that. Okay, so what I'm seeing is that overall, the word able is searched more than the word unable. If you wanted to mess around to figure out uh, how often people are searching different terms, you could head over to Google Trends and check that out. So I, I thought I would just bring that up as an example to help us think about what word frequencies are. And to return to this example, people chose the words that were, the, the words that people chose as their most preferred alternative also tended to have a higher word frequency in the natural language. All right, well, you might look at this and say, okay, fine, that's true, but, but look, people were asked to choose the more favorable word, and look at all these words on the, this side. They're all kind of more positive than these more negative words, so maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with the word frequency. It's just more to do with the meaning of the word, and it's kind of confounded with word frequency. So not the best evidence for the mirror exposure effect, I would say. Let's move on. Here's another example showing that favorability ratings depend on word frequency. So a different person showed people adjectives. And the question was, how much would you like the person described by this word? So you see an adjective and you have to imagine, okay, if somebody was like this word, um, say if somebody was, let's find an adjective, if somebody was um, responsible or somebody was unfortunate or somebody was kind or somebody was, I don't know, unfriendly, uh, you have to say how much you would like that person. And here is a graph of people's favorability ratings. And what we see here is that as the word frequency goes up in the natural language, so does people's average favorability rating. So it seems that people's ratings were influenced by how many times the words appear in the language. And this could provide evidence of the mirror exposure effect because the more people see a word, the more positively they will evaluate that word just because of the number of times they saw it. But we might have similar complaints about this kind of data. Maybe um, more positive words happen to have higher frequencies. Here's a few more examples that are non-experimental. So this is preference ratings for countries and cities as a function of how many times those words appear in the language. And we're seeing that people give higher ratings to cities uh, that have, to countries and cities that have a higher frequency of occurrence in the English language. Now, of course, these are the people that Zients uh, was reporting on in the 1960s. There could be uh, cultural, um, biases at play here. And so maybe that's another confound we could talk about.
Here's a last one before we get into some experimental evidence. So these are preference ratings for words relating to trees, fruits, vegetables, flowers, and so on. So people are asked to say, how much do you like um, pine trees or walnut trees or oak trees or rosewood trees or so on, and those things, and vegetables, flowers, etc. And the finding here is that people's preferences were correlated with how often those words appear in the language. So is it that people really like apples be, or is it that they're just saying they do because the word apple appears more than other kinds of fruits? All right, I think if we wanted to get some more solid evidence for the mere exposure effect, we would want to demonstrate that it can occur in a laboratory. And this could involve presenting people with unfamiliar information, taking that unfamiliar information and repeating it many times and seeing if people like it more and more as they get more experience with this unfamiliar information. So Johnson, Thompson, and Frink did that in 1960, and they had English-speaking participants. In the first phase, what they did was they rated the pleasantness of nonsense words. All right, so these are just random sequences of letters that they hadn't seen before. And you might think, well, okay. <laughs> so I see the letter sequence T-K-P-O-E-N, and I'm supposed to say if I like it or not. And people do this task. Then in phase two, they have to pronounce these non-words, so they're going to get more experience with seeing them. And they have to pronounce them one times, two times, five times, or ten times. So some of the words were pronounced one time, and some of them were all the way up to ten times. That means they'd been exposed to the word at least ten times. At the end, in the third phase, participants had to re-rate the pleasantness of the nonsense words. So what happened? The graph shows the results. And we're looking at the nonsense word results here. This is the rating, rated goodness uh, as a function of how many times people saw those words. And it looks like they went all the way up to 25. So the rating of goodness goes up and up and up as the number of exposures goes up. They also substituted these nonsense words with uh, Chinese characters that their participants weren't familiar with. And the more they saw those individual items, the more they judged them as pleasant also. We've got some another way of looking at the results here. So these are some example nonsense syllables that people had been exposed to. And some people saw these words with a low frequency, and some people saw them with a high frequency. So this was experimentally manipulated. If you only saw the words a few times, your rating of goodness was, well, I guess, lower than for the nonsense words you saw a lot of times. So it seems here that the number of exposures is is influencing your judgments about how you prefer these words. Here's another example, not using words. It is a mere exposure effect for pictures. And in this experiment, people looked at pictures, but they saw some pictures, uh, zero or one times, zero, one, two, five, ten, or twenty-five times. So zero, that would be, you've never seen this picture before, and you have to give a favorability of attitude rating between, say, zero and seven. This would be, you saw the picture one time already, and this is your second time seeing it. All the way up to, you could see this picture 25 times. So you'd be very familiar with the picture, but you still have to give an attitude rating. And what we see here is people's attitudes 
getting more positive as they've seen these photographs more and more. And here's a, another example here. These are, I guess, yearbook pictures of people's faces. I guess look looks like white male faces were the stimuli. And participants were shown these faces with a low frequency. So they saw them a few times, or they saw them with a high frequency. So they saw them many times. And uh, it's hard to read this, but these are favorability of attitude ratings are higher for the faces that were saw more frequently than less frequently. Okay. I'm going to talk about a couple more interesting findings. And in the second part of this mini lecture, we are going to focus more on these findings, these uh, later findings. So one kind of question here is, are people being influenced by the frequency of exposure on an implicit basis or an explicit basis? Is this something that's just happening to you? So if you see something a lot, does that mean you're going to positively uh, feel positively towards that thing no matter what? Or are people, you know, they're keeping track. I've seen that thing 47 times and therefore I will like it just a little bit more than normal. It seems, uh, it seems a little bit implausible that it's uh, happening on an explicit basis. And so researchers are interested in, in trying to understand some of the limitations here. Here's a, an interesting paper, again by Zients and co-author Kunst Wilson, where they show uh, that people can effectively discriminate stimuli that cannot be recognized. So let's jump into this and, and see what happens. Here's the kind of general question. Um, first of all, can the mere exposure effect occur even for subliminal stimuli? So subliminal stimuli can, are examples of things that can be presented so quickly that people aren't aware of them necessarily. You might think that if the mere exposure effect is in, related to implicit processing, you might be able to engage that implicit processing even with stimuli that people aren't necessarily aware of. So in this experiment, we're going to see a situation where researchers presented participants with stimuli uh, so fast that they were unable to recognize those stimuli in a memory test. But the question was, would they still show a preference for those things, even though they can't recognize them? Here's the method. In phase one, participants viewed an RSVP sequence of geometric shapes. So that stands for rapid serial visual presentation. So here's a depiction of this. Here's some geometric shapes. And these are different frames. And notice I have one millisecond. That's very, 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 very fast. So fast that if I was to show all these things at, uh, to you on a screen, it would just go by so quickly that you wouldn't even know really what you saw. So the shapes are presented below your ability to be aware of what you're seeing. Now, some of the shapes were um, repeated and some of them weren't. And at the end, we could do, or the researchers did, one of two kinds of tests, either a recognition test or a preference test. So you'd see a stream of these shapes, and then you'd be shown two shapes. One question was the recognition question. So you'd be asked, which of these did you see before? So the correct answer here would be this one. For example, this shape appeared two times in this list. This, uh, oh, I meant to, <laughs> I meant to uh, put one here that was not in the list. That was my bad. 
So both of these actually we can see are in this picture, but that's my mistake. In the, in the actual experiment, only one of these shapes would be, have been shown, so there's a correct answer. However, participants could also be given a, a preference question. So the question was, okay, which of these do you like more? You just have to choose which one you like more. It doesn't really matter if it was in the list or not. So everybody saw a bunch of pictures of shapes flashed so quickly they could barely see them. And then you were shown two shapes, one that was shown before and one that was new. And you had to say which one you recognized or you had to say which one you like more. So it's two ways to ask people to choose between an old picture and a new picture. All right, let's take a look at the results. When people were given the recognition performance, or sorry, the recognition test, uh, they're shown two pictures, they had to say which one they saw before, and one of them was shown before. Look at their performance. That's in these uh, solid black bars. Their performance is basically right at chance. And that's sensible. The pictures were presented so quickly that people were unable to recognize them accurately. However, look what happens for the preference task. So the very same pictures, instead of asking people, hey, which one did you see before? You just ask them, which one do you like more? Now they tend to prefer the picture that was actually shown before. And that's quite a bit above chance. So here we see an example where uh, repeated exposure to a subliminally presented stimulus seems to make people like that stimulus more, even though they can't recognize that they saw it before. So that's an interesting finding. We're going to talk about one more example of this. And I think, I, yeah, I did this right. So if I was uh, a person thinking, oh, that sounds interesting, I'd want to know that that result could be replicated. And here is a paper from 1984. And these authors replicate what we just talked about, and they extend it just a little bit. So the title of this paper is The Critical Importance of Exposure Duration for Effective Discrimination of Stimuli that are not recognized. They're doing something pretty simple here. Um, all they're doing is changing how long people get to see each stimulus. So if I go back and look at this stream of geometric shapes. In the original study, this each individual shape was presented very quickly for one milliseconds, which is really, really, really fast. <laughs> In this study, the duration of each shape was presented for one, two, eight, 12, 24, or 48 milliseconds. So they get longer and longer and longer. And simply put, that means you should be able to see them better. The longer the things on the screen, the easier it should be for you to see it and to know what it is and to recognize it. All right, so they did a similar task and manipulated exposure duration. They also gave people the recognition memory test or the preference test. And let's take a look and see what happens here. When the stimuli were presented for very short durations, one, two, or eight milliseconds a piece, what we see is that this line for recognition is right, right around 50%. So those items are being presented so quickly, people are unable to recognize them. They're guessing. They can't say which one they saw before. When they see two and they have to choose which one you saw before, they don't know. However, um, I guess, sorry, that's zero milliseconds, not one. 
when the stimuli are presented for two or eight milliseconds, something very interesting happens here. In the preference test, when people have to choose which of the two they like more, their percent target selection is now above chance. So even though they don't know which one they saw before, they tend to choose the one they saw before when they're making their choice about which one they like the most. So it seems they're somehow implicitly sensitive to the one they saw before, and they're using that to say they like it. At some point here, it looks like right around 12 milliseconds, if you make the picture appear long enough, people can see it. And now they're able to say, oh, I saw that one before. And their recognition performance goes way up, and they're, they're able to, to accurately identify the ones they saw. So I would say that this portion of the data shows a nice replication of the original study, that people appear to show a preference for subliminally presented items that they saw before, even though they aren't aware or can't directly recognize or recollect which one they saw before. All right, so we have reviewed some evidence that the mere exposure effect occurs in, in various ways. The, um, we saw lots of examples where the more you see something, the more you tend to give a positive evaluation of that thing. In the next part of this mini lecture, we're going to consider what the mere exposure effect tells us about cognition. We'll also consider what kind of cognitive processes give rise to the mere exposure effect. So the next part, we will talk about testing various explanations of the mere exposure effect. And I'm signing off. I'll see you over in, in part two.